Since the beginning of time, man has lived in awe of death. The ancients shrouded its mystery in intricate and powerful ritual. What drove ancient Egyptian priests to sell mummified reptiles? How did an ancient Chinese supercom invent techniques that virtually allowed the dead to speak from the grave? Did an ancient Chinese emperor use state-of-the-art technology to guarantee himself eternal life in a heaven on earth, complete with an army, a flowing river system, and automated weaponry against future invaders? And what actually happened to the physical body of Jesus Christ during his crucifixion? The mysteries of the rituals of death are our ancient discovery. One single fact unites every human being. From the first civilization to the present day, death comes to us all. I think there is a similarity across cultures and across time, because we're actually all terrified. Throughout the millennia, mankind has believed that there is more to our existence. This life has its perils and its hardships, but there is another life somewhere which is going to be wonderful. To achieve the transition to a chosen afterlife, we perform rituals that ease our passing into the next world. Today, most of the rituals that we perform throughout our lives have their roots in ancient history. And for billions of people all over the planet, there is no greater symbol of hope for eternal life than the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. The story of crucifixion is a difficult one to tell. And it's also a rather discouraging subject for those who want to think of the Roman Empire as something noble, diligent and dignified from which we today have taken so many of our customs and morals. Our investigations into the physiology of crucifixion reveal just how terrible this punishment is. The main purpose of crucifixion might not have been simply to execute, but to keep the victim alive in agony for as long as possible. But crucifixion is a lot older than the New Testament. It dates back to the dawn of civilization. Some scholars believe it was invented primarily as a ritual of death designed to raise a condemned man physically above the earth during execution. The ancients believed the earth itself was a living deity that must not be contaminated by the evil touch of a wrongdoer. This was a time when early man believed nature was driven and controlled by powerful gods. We're talking about uh, gods that make the sun shine, make the wind blow, uh, and all of that really is to do with survival. It's to do with harvest, it's to do with the crops, and so many ancient societies uh, focus on the harvest. Some of the most primeval deities were fertility gods, such as the earth goddess. Every ancient culture had its version of the Mother Earth Goddess. This would have been an incredibly important aspect in the lives of primitive people. Harvest, reproduction, plants growing, animals reproducing themselves. This would be absolutely crucial to both their cultural and their actual physical well-being. It was vital not to offend the Earth Goddess. Any kind of variance in her wonderful, bountiful gifts could have such a, an adverse effect on their actual lifestyle and their health. Crucifixion satisfied a primitive religious necessity not to contaminate Holy Mother Earth with the unholy blood of the condemned man. This desire became ritualized into an execution method that survived for thousands of years. So over a period of time, these kind of primitive beliefs would have become sort of codified and rationalized. This gives us an insight into rituals of death. Often the underlying reason for a ritual becomes lost and forgotten until all that remains is the ritual itself. Over hundreds of years, crucifixion lost its spiritual significance and became solely an instrument of punishment and execution, primarily in the ancient East. Crucifixion was not invented by the Romans. It in fact had been a part of a lot of ancient societies dating back perhaps to the 6th century BC into the Persian Empire. It was discovered in Persia by Alexander the Great in the 4th century BC and he brought it back into Europe. 
Alexander the Great seems to have brought it back from the east, but it was the Romans who really um, employed this method big time. Crucifixion became widespread throughout the Roman world. One of the worst things about the Roman Empire was their punishments. Crucifixion, the summum supplicium, the worst punishment the Romans could deal out. It was an instrument of social control. We're talking about uh, a very small governmental structure that somehow has to control a large population. Uh, a population that could well be lawless, that could well be criminal. The way to do that is to terrify the people into behaving. Crucifixion was not necessarily about finding a punishment that suited the crime. Quintilian, one of the ancient sources, speaks specifically to the point of crucifixion being its exemplary effect. That means that it would deter other people from committing crimes. It was the ultimate deterrent, the same argument that is used today for the death penalty in the United States. Crucifixion was reserved for the lowest sections of society. If you were a Roman citizen, in most circumstances, you could not be crucified. Crucifixion was reserved for enemies, for traitors, for criminals, and for slaves. It was for the other. The call on the cross, in one particular case, when Cicero is accusing Verres, is that Verres crucified a Roman citizen, knowingly crucified a Roman citizen. And it's on that that Verres is punished. It was rare for anyone to survive more than a few hours on the cross. But in 63 AD, the historian Josephus recorded the crucifixion of three men. Josephus was one of the ancient historians who chronicles the siege of Jerusalem in 70 AD. In Josephus' account, one of the three victims was still alive after three days. And so impressed with this were the authorities that they decided to let him down and he survived the whole crucifixion process. How did he survive? Crucifixion was not necessarily an execution. It was an agonizing, obscene and humiliating punishment. Dr. Rob Hicks and James Dean are investigating exactly what happens to a body during a crucifixion. Perhaps this will reveal how the victim in the account by Josephus survived. What he's going through during a crucifixion is akin to a major accident. He could be bleeding to death, his kidneys will be packing up, his heart could stop, he could have a cardiac arrest. He will certainly be becoming unconscious at some stage, whether that's because of dehydration or because of simply not being able to get the oxygen into, into his lungs. The images of outstretched arms and nails in the hands and feet is familiar to people all over the world. But now, for the first time, James and Rob are using 3D graphics to explore the internal trauma of a crucifixion victim. They have discovered that the body weight pushing down on the lungs makes it increasingly difficult to raise the ribs to inhale. We see his diaphragm move down. We see the intercostal muscles here by the ribs struggling. We get the recession there showing just how hard he's working to breathe properly and in time that's going to become so difficult that he will give up. He'll become unconscious and he'll die. James and Rob have discovered a primary cause of death during execution. Suffocation. With the arms raised, the victim cannot raise his ribs properly to inhale. This painful prolonged torture can last for hours, even days, depending on the fitness of the victim. He cannot inhale or exhale sufficiently to stay alive. He will struggle against that because it's instinctive to try and stay alive, but eventually he will lose. Our simulation has revealed how the victim in Josephus' account may have survived the ordeal. If somebody has basically given up hope, they're more likely to give in and die. If you've got a positive outlook saying, look, I'm going to beat this, then there's a better chance of survival. And it depends on the strength of the man and the condition he's in as to how long that lasts. The faint possibility of surviving crucifixion does not diminish its horror. In the Roman world, keeping control of your own body was the ultimate human right. And so to crucify someone, to take their body and to nail it or hold it to a cross with ropes and to allow them to die slowly, agonizingly over days was the ultimate deterrent and the ultimate punishment. It dishonored the individual more than any other punishment possibly could. 
a primeval pagan ritual of death designed to not offend nature gods was reinvented by the Romans as a torture method. But with the suffering of Christ, the cross was reborn to become an element of a new ritual of death for Christians right to the present day. But what people believe comes after death is different across the ages and from culture to culture. In ancient Egypt, animals were thought to be messengers between this world and the next. Now, ancient discoveries will investigate the mystery of crocodile mummies. Ancient Egypt was a civilization obsessed with the rituals of death. Some of the most amazing achievements ever created were built by the Egyptians, and nearly all of them were concerned with death and the afterlife. The pyramids, the great tombs, temples, and mummies. But it was not only people who were mummified. The ancient Egyptians also mummified animals. To discover why, Egyptologist and mummy expert Salima Ikram has traveled to the temple of Kom Ombo on the bank of the great river Nile. There probably was always a temple at Kom Ombo because generally sites where you see a temple, the temple is built there because that site has been sacred for hundreds and hundreds of years. The temple was dedicated to the crocodile god Sobek. The ancient Egyptians chose a lot of their gods based on the natural world, and crocodiles are large, terrifying things, so they wanted to appease them. Also, of course, anything that comes from the Nile or from water has a very sacred nature for the ancient Egyptians, because one of their creation myths talk about how the world emerged from water. Sobek became among Egypt's most important deities. He really came into his own about 2000 BC when a lot of lakes were being used and there were crocodiles there and so any god associated with water and with power of fertility and virility like Sobek were all, beca all became sort of very important and that's when Sobek first started having major temples dedicated to himself. Crocodiles were allowed to roam freely around the temple in honor of the god. Not only did they have the traditional images of the god kept in a sacred place, but they also had live crocodiles here who were the personification of the god Sobek. And so people would come for miles and miles around to go and visit the god, to make offerings to the god, and also sort of to be in the presence of the deity himself. The crocodile was revered even after death. Here in a side room are the desiccated remains of an animal that once wandered in the temple. This priceless relic was once venerated by countless pilgrims. This crocodile has probably been dead for at least 2,000 years and maybe a bit more. Worshippers would also make offerings of mummified crocodiles to the gods. By giving a votive offering of a crocodile, what the worshipper does is, is offer something that is much more intimate to the god. And also, this little mummified crocodile acted as a sort of ambassador for the person for all of eternity. So you always had someone whispering to Sobek. The first stage of mummification is to immerse the body in natural salts to draw out the moisture. Without moisture, it cannot rot. When it is completely dry, it is coated in a preservative resin to bind the surface against deterioration. Preserving a reptile was relatively easy compared with catching one. Acquiring crocodiles must have taken some skill. Because crocodiles are enormous, very fierce creatures. And you wouldn't want to be on the, the head end of them unless you really knew what you were doing. So I think acquiring the crocodiles was a, a great act of adventure and of faith. But even obtaining a little one posed a problem. There weren't enough to go around. One of the problems, of course, with having so many pilgrims wanting to give votive mummies as offerings is that sometimes the demand exceeded the supply. The priests of Kom Ombo Temple were forced to improvise. Some of the crocodile bundles do not contain what they're supposed to contain. They might contain a fragment of it, or else they might contain a piece of, of wood or a stone or even a fragment of a human body part, but wrapped up to look as if it actually is whatever creature is supposed to be being offered. No one would know what was really inside. On the whole, 
the better wrapped and the more beautiful the exterior of a mummy, the more likely it is that inside there's going to be a fake because it's almost as if the priest was saying, oof, we're feeling really guilty, now we have to make it look perfect because inside it is imperfect, so at least the exterior must be a manifestation of what it's supposed to be. Still, there is ambiguity in the deception. For the priests, certainly, they could hold these two ideas in their minds at the same time, not really feel terribly fraudulent about it. But I think if the pilgrims had really known they didn't have crocodiles inside their pseudo-crocodile mummies, they would have been quite upset. 100 years ago, the American explorer Henry Welcome discovered a perfectly preserved example of a mummified crocodile, one he believed to be a fake. But is it? The specimen is kept at the Egypt Center of Swansea University in Britain. We do have whole live crocodiles that have been mummified, but on the other hand, we also have an awful lot of fakes. Veterinary surgeon Emma Littler has been called in to look inside this ancient relic using an X-ray machine. For the first time in 2,000 years, the crocodile mummy will give up its secret. We will know what is inside it so we can know once and for all, hopefully, whether or not there was a real crocodile in there or whether it is just a bag of sand. And what we see is... There is definitely yeah, something in there. Absolutely, absolutely clear. There we are. So you can see here the outline of the, the head. Um, and this is just the first two sections, so it's actually embedded in, or it's inside See, the first two sections. It starts from about there, does it? That yeah, that's right, and there's there nothing in this, there's, there's a couple of ways, there's nothing in the tail. This remarkable artifact does indeed contain the remains of a crocodile that once swam the waterways of ancient Egypt over 2,000 years ago. It is not a fake, but a genuine messenger to the gods. This discovery reveals the lengths that man will go to perform rituals of death. To capture and mummify dangerous beasts, as well as allowing them to roam freely in a sacred temple, demonstrates the ancients' reverence toward death. Next, Ancient Discoveries uses forensic science to examine the roles of other animals as messengers of death. It involves murder and some bizarre detective work. To the naked eye, these five sickles appear identical. But 800 years ago, a Chinese super cop named Sung Si invented an ingenious way of telling which had been used in a murder. We may owe our understanding of crime scene investigation to Sung Si. Sung Si wrote down his ideas in an ancient text that brought science for the first time into criminal investigation. David Hughes, a modern crime scene investigator, has been studying the ancient evidence. I think one could call Sung Si the great, great grandfather of uh, modern forensics because he actually wrote some information, as we know, in The Washing Away of Wrongs. The Washing Away of Wrongs is an 800-year-old text that describes ancient forensic detective work. Before his time, several books had been written which touched on questions of forensic medicine, but he was the first to systematize them and produce a work which brought together the body of knowledge which had been accumulating. This is the first written record of the instructions to scene investigators to actually go out to uh, what to look for at scenes. In that sense, he could be described as the father of modern forensic science. Following the account in Sung Si's book, Ancient Discoveries will reconstruct how he solved the case of a brutal murder 800 years ago. In around 1230 AD, the inhabitants of a remote Chinese village were shocked to discover one of them had been murdered with an unidentified blade. There were no witnesses, and in those days, no police force to call in. Most of the minor legal cases were tried by village headmen who effectively were conscripted into the job. They were not paid and their work quite often involved a lot of expenditure and probably making themselves unpopular among the people they had to live with. The village headman appealed to the state capital for help. Members of Song Tzu's class 
were scholars who had reached their position through successfully passing the examinations and it was their responsibility to oversee this somewhat chaotic system and to act as intermediaries between the village officials and the imperial court. Song Si was sent to the village to investigate. People like Song Si would have travelled around the country investigating particularly difficult cases, either from a technical point of view or because there were powerful interests involved. With no evidence and no witnesses, the murderer must have felt he had nothing to fear from a visiting scholar. From his own account of the cases he was involved in, he seems to have operated as some sort of super detective who was called in to deal with these particularly difficult cases. Song Si's first task was to identify the murder weapon. He knew from practical research that different blades produced different types of wounds. Sung Si's examination of the body showed a ragged gash with specific characteristics. Ancient historian Mai Trao reenacts how Sung Si might have tackled his investigation. Mai uses the carcass of a pig purchased from the local butcher shop. This is the first one. This is the 16th century broadsword, and as you can see, uh, it has left that kind of cut. This is our stabbing wound. You can tell up to a point, but only up to a point, the size of that blade. It didn't go in very far, so we don't know how long it was. Now look at the damage done by the sickle. It is absolutely horrendous. It has gouged through the skin and through the tissue beneath. It could actually have gone through bone as well. Different blades cause very different wounds. So it's possible for a forensic scientist, and it was possible for Sun Qi in the 13th century, to know what had caused this wound. A sickle did it. The only problem is that there were thousands of sickles in medieval China. Which one was he looking for? A sickle was a common tool in the rural communities of ancient China. Sung Si summoned every villager to appear before him and ordered them to bring their sickles. Over 200 cleaned and polished sickles were presented to him. How was Sung Si to know which sickle was the murder weapon? In reality, it's very difficult to completely clean an object. Even when somebody thinks they've cleaned off a murder weapon, inevitably there are going to still be specks of material left on there. Today, forensic scientists would use microscopic analysis to trace these minute scraps of evidence. But in 13th century China, Sung Si did not have such technical resources. Instead, he deputized thousands of tiny investigators. Blowflies. Mai is joined by forensic scientist Amarit Whitaker as they attempt to solve Sung Si's case 800 years after the crime was committed. Sung Si placed all the sickles in the sun and waited. Mai wipes animal blood from a butcher's on the blade. Over the cutting edge of the weapon, the business end. Now, any murderer worth his salt would realize there is blood on this weapon and he wants to get rid of it. So what does he do? He takes a rag and he wipes it. We're going to place the murder weapon inside this case, like so, with the others in the series. And to the naked eye, they all look identical. Now, we'll see what the flies can tell us. Yeah, what we're hoping is that the flies will find the one out of these five sickles which has got the blood on it. Within minutes, flies make straight for the bloody sickle. Oh, look, we've got one. Look at that. Yes, yes, yes. Sung Si was right. Ultra macro photography reveals the secret of the tiny detectives. If there are traces of blood or tissue on something like a knife or a sickle, then certainly the flies are going to be attracted to that rather than to other knives which have no blood on them. He's having a jolly good feast there by the look of it. Microscopic fragments of blood and tissue remain trapped in imperfections in the metal. Seeing with the naked eye, there's no way to tell whether this sickle has been used in a murder. However, if we change to the scale of a blowfly, then the world becomes a very different place. Suddenly, the blade doesn't appear quite so smooth. These imperfections trap particles of blood and tissue, and these stand out to the blowfly like neon fast food signs indicating a good meal. Even if the flies can't see the particles, they can rely on another sense, the sense of smell. Tiny particles are breaking off and atomizing and spreading through the air. 
And these particles activate receptors on the blowfly. It's almost as if they can see the smell. In the confines uh, of the 13th century, we would certainly be suggesting that this was a case of murder, looking at the evidence. The victims spoke from beyond the grave via these miniature messengers of death. Forensic detection took another step into the modern era. The study of insects remains an important part of modern CSI. It is known as forensic entomology. I think certainly anybody that works in the area of forensic entomology who's interested would know about that case. It's certainly cited in a lot of papers and every interview that's ever given about forensic entomology. So yes, it's very important. As far as I know, it's the first properly documented case where forensic entomology was specifically used to solve a crime. You may owe our understanding of crime scene investigation to Sung Si. The rituals and practices surrounding death have all developed in response to human need. In Sung Si's murder cases, the need was to receive information from the dead. Christians search for spiritual salvation through the cross. Ancient Egyptians sent animal envoys to lobby the gods directly. But in 3rd century BC China, they went one step further. They used technology to create the afterlife, right here on Earth. In the 3rd century BC, Qin Shi Huang, the first emperor of China, built an extraordinary tomb in which to enjoy eternity. An ancient text written by the first historian of China, Sima Qian, tells of rivers of mercury flowing like water inside Qin's mausoleum. Ancient Discoveries is investigating the purpose and engineering behind this strange discovery. In 220 BC, the country had been at war for about 500 years. It started out with some 700 independent states, and by 221 they had been whittled down to one, which was the state of Qin. Qin created a nation that has lasted 2,000 years. Qin was so successful in its career of conquest that it has become synonymous with the whole of China today. A 10,000 square mile empire wealthy and powerful beyond imagination. Qin was terrified of losing his throne and even more terrified of dying. He wanted his life and power to last for all eternity. So he searched the known world for the secret of eternal life. He was constantly sending emissaries off to far corners of the globe to find potions or wise men who could help him with this. Fearful of being executed if they came back empty-handed, no one returned. As if expecting the search for the elixir of eternal life to fail, Qin embarked on an equally ambitious project, one whose many mysteries lie untapped to this day. But at the same time, as soon as he came to the throne, he set hundreds of thousands of convicts to work on building a tomb for himself. I myself find a bit of a paradox here, because if you're never going to die, what do you need a mausoleum for? He was hedging his bets. If he could not have eternal life, he would rule forever in death. The reason why he built that mausoleum was partly because he needed that uh, kingdom, that rather empire. He needed his resources, he needed his palace, he needed his warriors, he needed his servants and everything else to continue ruling in the afterlife. In the south of his empire, he built a mausoleum complex over an area of 56 square miles. There are obviously many things about the, the Emperor Qin's uh, mausoleum that are fascinating. But if I had to single out one thing, it would probably be the, the sheer scale of, of the site. Everything is so massive. Everything you could possibly imagine, or even things that you would never imagine that were going to be there. Not only they are there, but they are multiplied by a hundred or by a thousand. It is not simply a mausoleum. Complete with mountains and rivers, sculpted to the last detail, the tomb was an exact scale replica of real China. The idea obviously was to represent in microcosm the entire sphere over which he ruled. Based on an ancient Chinese text written by Sima Qian 100 years after the emperor's death, ancient model maker Richard Windley has reconstructed the layout of the tomb. These, um, these accounts imply that this map was actually fairly accurate in its detail. We've got the main rivers it's probably likely that um, the terrain was actually fairly um, accurately constructed as well. For the rivers, Qin did not use water. Instead, 
he filled the channels with mercury. Mercury is a metal unlike any other. It is liquid at room temperature. This unique property fascinated the ancient Chinese and gave it mystical significance. So I think this idea of mercury as the enigmatic substance that defies nature may be the reason that explains why people thought that it could also extend their own lives. But creating whole rivers made of thousands of tons of mercury was not the most amazing part. Chin's engineers also designed an ancient turbine that drove the liquid metal around the tomb. After the first emperor died, his successor had the skilled workmen who'd worked on the tomb buried alive in order to preserve the secrets. For that reason, probably, we don't know how the mercury was propelled around the model. Sima Chen simply says that it was some mechanism, and he obviously didn't know the details himself. Richard Windley is working with leading academics to speculate how this feat of hydraulics might have been achieved. Janice Lee is the senior curator of the site and one of its greatest worldwide authorities. Do you think we've got a reasonable representation here? Yeah. The experts have come up with a theory that may give us new insights into how the Mercury Rivers were caused to flow around the tomb. Archaeological evidence from the same period shows that the ancient Chinese were proficient with the water wheel and the axle. We know there were underground streams in the area. It would have been fairly easy, given the technology of the time, to harness these to some kind of water mill that could have driven the mercury around the tomb. What I've decided to go with to solve these problems in, in model form is a horizontal water wheel. This is driving a kind of paddle wheel. So effectively, we've got a horizontal wheel driving a vertical wheel. Richard fills the model rivers with a mercury substitute and turns on the flow to simulate the action of the real underground rivers. It rather looks as though it's working actually and it's, it seems to have settled down and it's all actually working quite nicely. Water from the river is directed down a channel onto a horizontal water wheel and away into the earth. This is connected via a right angled gearing system to a vertical water wheel which pushes the mercury round the tomb. As long as the water source still flowed, the emperor would have had rivers of liquid metal flowing through his afterlife empire for eternity. Surrounded by life-giving rivers of mercury, the emperor could reign over his replica kingdom for eternity and finally satisfy his lifelong dream of ruling forever. But just to be sure, he took out even more insurance. Sima Qian mentions more sinister features of these ancient rituals of death. Emperor Qin was accompanied on his journey into the next world by hundreds of slaves and concubines, all buried alive. He also had 8,000 terracotta warriors to guard him. And perhaps more practical against the grave robbers of the future, a system of lethal booby traps. Qin's ghostly defenses are our final ancient discovery. This is part of a tomb complex that was built in the third century BC as the eternal resting place for the first emperor of one of the world's most successful empires, China. Like something out of an Indiana Jones story, this enormous tomb was filled with weapons and treasures fit for the most powerful man on earth. With so much of value in the tomb, the emperor needed to know his eternal resting place would be safe from robbers or anyone seeking to desecrate the holy site. To ensure the safety of himself and his belongings, he ordered his engineers to produce solutions that seem right out of a movie. Booby trap defenses. In the historical records, they gave this information about the tomb. And so uh, they have, in the, in the dark corridors of the tomb, they fixed a crossbow triggers there. So if any robbers dare to enter the tomb, the crossbow will release the arrows automatically. Ancient Discoveries is investigating the technology of the first emperor's tomb defenses. Our investigators use their knowledge of contemporary Chinese technology to speculate what these booby trap devices might have been. 
Well, what I've covered here are our sort of proposed reconstructions of the booby trap crossbows for Chin's tomb. There are several variants. Um, we've got several which just fire single arrows. Ancient Chinese crossbows had a draw strength of up to 300 pounds and fired bronze-tipped bolts two to three feet long. But probably will be bamboo. This is a fairly typical sort of largish arrow. Uh, we've got a, a nice sharp point on the front. There'll be a tang which runs down inside the bamboo. Other bows could fire several bolts at once. We've got a crossbow which is called uh, in Chinese a lian nu, which is a, a multi-bolt crossbow. This fires four bolts at once. There's one single string as per a normal bow. They do actually run in grooves, which is going to help to keep them going in a reasonably straight direction. Ancient Discoveries has built a replica of one of the entrances to the Great Tomb. So behind the walls of the corridors of the tomb were the covert devices. Now these were the devices that weren't intended to be seen. These were the ones that were going to cause the damage. And these were the booby trap devices that were going to help to protect the tomb from anyone that was going to try and intrude, who was going to try and rob the tomb, who was going to try and disturb the peace of the emperor. But of course we've got to find some way of actually triggering the device. Evidence from the period tells us that crossbows activated by tripwires were used to kill animals for food. In the set we've got here, the tripwires are fairly visible. They're quite light colored so that the camera will pick them up. But in actual fact, they probably would have been dark colored. They'd have been designed to actually blend with the background. So the whole idea is that somebody shambling or, or shuffling through the tomb would hit any number of these and, and each one would trigger a different kind of device. Richard tests the tripwires using blunt dummy arrows. Though the crossbows would have been excellent defense against the living, they offered little protection against the dead. The emperor commissioned a bodyguard of thousands to accompany him into the next world, a bodyguard to defend him from attack by the spirits of the dead. And I certainly believe that they are not just there to represent something, they are not a monument, but they are there to be used to provide to, to provide a role certainly for the afterlife. With every passing day, archaeologists are uncovering more of these lifelike figures. Each of the 8,000 warriors is unique, with a personalized face. Now a new theory is seeking to explain why the first emperor went to so much trouble to make his soldier guards individuals. The answer lies in the tumultuous origins of Qin's empire. The Chinese nation was born out of war. The unification was achieved purely by military force. Qin had more soldiers than any other Chinese state. They were organized by a totalitarian regime and they simply overwhelmed all their rivals one by one. China, as it became known, came into being under a reign of terror. The court of the first emperor was certainly run on very authoritarian lines, which emphasized strict punishments, inflexible laws, and the subordination of everything to the interests of the state. Life at the Qin court must have been pretty terrifying. The subjects of the infant state lived in fear of their new emperor, and the emperor lived in fear of his subjects. The emperor was also more and more paranoid as time went on. He moved secretly from one palace to another to avoid the possibility of assassination. The emperor remained paranoid, seemingly even in death. Fearful of the many enemies he had made in his ruthless rise to power, Emperor Qin surrounded himself with an elite bodyguard in this life that he planned to take with him into the next. They are the army that would have carried on into the afterlife. If a man needs an army in this life, he might well need an army in an afterlife too. A man who had been responsible for the deaths of thousands had every reason to be worried about who might be waiting for him on the other side. If we do believe that people after they died, they would continue to live and to hold on to their belongings, their power, etc., that would apply to the emperor himself, but also to everyone else. Now, if throughout his rule, he was killing or massacring thousands of people, including very powerful warriors and kings and princes, surely those people would be waiting for him in the afterlife to take revenge. The first emperor's paranoia and ego demanded that he be surrounded by an elite bodyguard. But he didn't order his real bodyguard to be buried with him. According to the ancient texts written by the historian Sima Qian, the emperor Qin had his entire court buried alive with him. His servants, wives, musicians, entertainers, down to his favorite horse and chariot. The burden of accompanying the emperor into the afterlife 
fell somewhat unfairly on his, his servants and followers. Um, his successor had his concubines buried alive with him and the workmen who worked on the tomb were also buried there partly in order to ensure that the, the secrets of the security devices remained secret. If he could order the deaths of hundreds of people from beyond the grave, why didn't he have his real bodyguard buried alive with him? The answer may be simple and also shed light on ancient Chinese belief. One reason for this is obviously that these were the toughest soldiers in the whole of China and it was not going to be easy to persuade them to go quietly as human sacrifices. The emperor was compelled to create the famous terracotta army because he realized that after his death there would be no one strong enough to force the toughest soldiers in the land to join him. Despite their loyalty, such devotion to their lord was more than he could reasonably expect and his successor might also not be willing to sacrifice such valuable assets. An army of 8,000 is not lightly given up. This left Qin with a dilemma. He couldn't take his real guard into the tomb, yet he was too paranoid to surround himself with strangers who may have been planted there to attack him in the afterlife. Each of these 8,000 terracotta warriors has been depicted as an individual with individually sculpted features. I think it's reasonable to assume that they represent the actual people who guarded the emperor in his life. After all, for someone as paranoid as him who lived in perpetual fear of being assassinated, he would not want to go into the next world accompanied by people he didn't know. It must have been reassuring that these images actually represented the few people on earth that he knew and could trust. If the features of the terracotta warriors are indeed portraits of real-life soldiers, then when we look at these stony, silent faces, we stare into the faces of men who once protected and fought for the founder of one of the greatest empires the world has ever known. The rituals of death surrounding Qin's tomb allow us to get right inside the mind of an emperor and a people who lived over 2,000 years ago. Just as ancient Egyptian death rituals reveal how they thought, what they believed, and what they wanted from life. This is a key to what they want in their long-term lives, but as a result, we really know what they wanted in their life. The reason for this is that rituals of death may be about death, but are actually performed, cherished, and enshrined, not by the dead, but by the living. Some practices surrounding death from the ancient world are still employed unchanged today. Others have changed their meaning and symbolism over millennia, yet have attained new and powerful relevance to millions in the modern world. The rituals of death reveal the secrets not just of our desires for an afterlife, but what desires we hold dearest in this life.